This is the uh, Georgia Real Estate Investor Super Group, hosted by yours truly, Carson Olinger here with Capital City Equity Group. A little bit about me. I am a uh, seasoned investor here uh, in the Atlanta metro market, kind of north metro Atlanta. And I've been flipping homes and investing in properties for the last five years. I started off as a wholesaler. And we now have, by the end of March, April, I think, we're going to own about 140 uh, doors that we rent. And we're flipping homes left and right and wholesaling as well. And we even have some notes that we've done. So this class is designed to help you, the new investor here in Georgia. My contact information, if you need to reach me, is 678-478-2230. That number again, 678 678- 478-2230. My email is carson at capcityeg.com. That's carson at capcityeg.com. Company is Capital City Equity Group. You can follow us on Facebook. Follow me on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I also have a YouTube page under my personal name, Carson Olinger. Uh, please subscribe to that. There's a lot of great informative videos on pitfalls in the industry and what we're dealing with, as well as updates on the flips that we're doing. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of stuff on site. So I just got off of Walk the Flip, which is a uh, monthly um, class that I teach here on the REI USA platform uh, about walking a flip. How do you walk through a flip and understand what to do? We actually hold that class, and I meant to tell the, the people on the other class, we actually hold that class in person at various flips around the Atlanta metro area. I've got colleagues We'll take that platform, we'll go to their location, do a walk the flip with them at their location, at my location, and allow you to come in for free and kind of see a flip and see what's going on and ask those questions. So this platform is a usually a very small group of people that come in that are wanting to learn how to, how to get into investing. It could be wholesaling, it could be um, flipping, it could be buy and holds, it could be notes, it could be whatever you want to do in terms of real estate. This is the opportunity to talk to other like-minded investors, as well as uh, the coach, myself, and, and steer you in the right direction so you have the tools to succeed. This is not going to be me sitting here preaching for an hour and giving you some kind of class. This is interactive. This is you asking questions and building on what you need to know. You took the time to be here. You took the time to be part of this program. You took the time to grow your business. You have questions we have answers. If I don't, I will get you answers from somebody else. That's what we're here for. We want you to succeed by using this platform. So this is your opportunity. And I love this because it's so small. You can ask questions. You can have one-on-one -on -one dialogue. I mean, right now, we've got just one person coming in. There's a couple, two more people coming in. So if you have questions, this is not, like I said, this is not me just giving you a subject matter and going through a PowerPoint. This is an opportunity to open things up and talk about specifics. Keep in mind, there are other people here, so we don't need to talk about the details of a deal. We need to talk about broad concepts here of how to get into investing and what to do. We can elaborate in certain areas, but this is here for you. We want you guys to be able to learn and grow and take the information you learn here on the USA platform and take it out into the field, all right? So our platform here is pretty simple. I'm going to open this up to allow you guys to ask questions, to talk, to figure out what you want to do. And I'm here to answer your questions. So any questions? <laughs> if it's not, it's going to be a short lit, short program today. Yes, Jennifer. All right. Well, I always have questions. <laughs> um, That's fine. That's so what this thinking is for. more about. So thinking more about raising private capital, um, I was on the last session and just thinking about interest rates. So I have a few investors, they're not, they're not experienced um, in lending private capital. They're near retirement age. So, you know, they said 8% was a rate that sounded good for them. I'm cool paying 8%, but I want to make sure that I'm not taking advantage of anyone. Um, so do you think that's at least a a good minimum rate or should I go higher? What are your thoughts on that? I think that's a good place to start. I wouldn't, if you got below six, I would think you'd be taking advantage of somebody. Um, think about the person you're dealing with. They're, 
they're in a position of close to being retired. They don't want to put their money at adverse risk. So adverse risk to them means high interest. You know, that kind of stuff scares me. I'm going to give you a 20% return. Oh, that sounds great. I'd love to get 20%, but that seems kind of sketchy to me. So giving them a higher rate of return on paper might scare them. It sounds totally illogical, but it might scare them because they want conservatism. They want to know they're going to get a steady 8% and they're going to be happy with it. The problem is at the end of your loan, like might be three, four, five months, it's not going to be a lot of money unless you're borrowing a lot of money. So here's what I do. I give them what they want. I give them that 8%. And at the end of the deal, if I made a pretty good amount of money, I pay them their 8% and then I give them a little bit more. I said, hey, I was profitable on this deal. You lent me the money at a good rate. Here's an extra five grand. Here's an extra $200 or whatever. And you make it look like you gave them a 15% rate of return. Got it. That's, I've um, done that. And, and that said, they go, wow, I'm getting more than what I anticipated. And I was in a secure position. I'm going to come back and do this again. I like that. I like that for me and for them. Um, I guess another question is, how do you determine when you need private money? Like one of the things that my husband and I are weighing right now is that we've been using hard money for our flips. Okay. Um, we we were able to get a HELOC on a property for a hundred thousand. I think the rate's like between three and four percent. So should I still borrow the private capital at eight percent when I have? access to a HELOC at 4%. Um, the HELOC is for the whole acquisition and the rehab of the property? No, like there, we were able to purchase some properties using our own cash, um, like in smaller areas like Warner Robins, Dublin, Georgia. Um, so the properties costs were like 30,000 and then we need to put 30 or 40 into it. Well, most, most hard money lenders aren't going to lend you money under $50,000 anyway. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's say it's $70,000. You got to borrow 70. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're going to, what's your interest rate on your, for your hard money? Uh, 8.49. 8.49. That's really strong. That's who are you borrowing with? Lachlan Capital. Oh, you know, okay. I know They're this. a broker. So yeah, sometimes they go through house max. Sometimes they go through lending home. Yeah. So they're a broker. How many deals have you done? Uh, six. In the last two years? Yep. Okay. Um, I use lending home. Their lending home is now called Kavi. They changed their name mm -hmm. recently to Kavi, K-A-I-V-I, -I, I think it is. Um. You could go directly to lending home and get that same rate because you're probably paying a lot of points to Lachlan, aren't you? Yeah, they're, we're down to two points because I've done multiple deals with them now. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. I mean, that's that's not bad. I mean, if they're if you got history with them, that that's not a bad deal because you can you can go directly to lending home, start a whole new process, and you could probably get eight point seven five with one point. But you've got a relationship okay. with um, Lynn, with uh, Lachlan, and that one point is probably going to be worth it in the long run. I wouldn't steer clear of them. I'd, I'd stick with what you got. It's pretty good. So think about that. $70,000. I'm a math guy, so I got my calculator right here, right? So $70,000 at 8.75%. How long? That's $6,100 in interest over the course of a year, okay? How long are you holding the property? Um, I would say probably about 90 days, 90 to 120 days. Okay. So you're doing $510 a month. <clears throat> At four months, you're, you're paying them back $2,000 in interest, All right? On your home equity line of credit, on that same $70,000, at how much, what was your point? Four points, 4%? Four yeah, four, yeah, 4%. Four percent. You're paying $233. So really the difference between what you're buying at 8% and what you're buying at 4% is 
is about 250 bucks a month. Okay. At the end of the day, it's an extra thousand bucks. So here's where I come in and I analyze this thing a little bit different. A thousand bucks is a thousand bucks. That's two car payments. That's, you know, a vacation. You know, it's not anything to sneeze at. I'm not blowing it away. But if you're running this business, how many flips are you doing at a time? Are you capable of doing more? If you use all of your money on your HELOC to buy one house, now you're locked in. If you use a hard money lender and they, they finance you at 90%, all you gotta do is take 10% of that HELOC and put it towards that house. So now you're not really using any of your money, you're using everybody else's money, but you, now you've got more money for your HELOC to buy more deals at 10% down. And you probably got some money left over to flip them without having to go through the uh, hard money lender to flip. I like to buy, I like to use hard money to acquire and then I get private capital, as you asked, this is your question, to use private capital to fund, to uh, do the rehab because it's easier. I don't have to do inspections and all the other stuff. So I'll go to, I'll go to Lachlan Capital or I'll go to Lending Home and I'll say, hey, I got $100,000, $100,000 house, you'll fund it at 90. Uh, my contract's 100, give me 90 grand. I got 25,000 in rehab. I'll take my HELOC at 4%. And I'll use the 25,000 to rehab the house and then be done with it. <clears throat> now, do you, you get don't more want to... favorable terms when you don't? Okay. Go ahead. I was saying, do you get more favorable terms when you don't borrow the rehab firm? No, it has like nothing to do with favorability. It, it's just easier okay. because if you borrow the money to the 100% funding of the rehab, right? Hey, you got a $25,000 rehab, we'll fund it 100%. Sounds great, but you've got a front end loaded. So let's say you need $10,000 to start. They're not going to give you the 10,000. You still have to come up with that 10,000. So you come up with the 10,000 and you get done with a certain amount of work and you go, hey, I finished you know, the first couple of weeks of work. We spent $10,000. Here's all my receipts. I need you, Lachlan Capital, to come out and do an inspection. Seven days later, they finish it. Then they give you the $10,000 back that you spent. And then you go do that again. And, but it's this process. It just, it's, a, it's a hurdle I don't got to deal with. If I can find the rehab money somewhere else, hey, here's 50 grand. They throw it in my bank and I just roll. I don't got to worry about getting inspections, paying them $100, $200 to do the inspection, waiting seven days to get reimbursed. And it just, it's too much. It, it sucks my time down. It's more administrative work that I want to deal with. Yes, that's exactly what I'm going through right now. Right. <laughs> I like the, okay, I like that strategy. You're an investor. You invest money. Okay. You're not a general contractor. You're not, even if you're rehabbing a house, other people should be swinging the hammers. Okay. I hire a general contractor. Okay. A lot of people will tell me, wow, you're giving up 20% hiring a general contractor. Yes, I am. All day, every day. I'll do it all day long. Why? Because I don't want to be dealing with hiring a plumber, hiring an electrician, hiring a, uh, this guy, hiring a flooring guy, hiring a painter, hiring a roofer. Oh, the roofer didn't show up and I need to get the roof on. It's going to rain. I don't got to deal with that. Invoices, invoices, invoices. I'm not a general contractor. If you do these projects yourself, that's what you will become. Okay. So I try and push that off on other people. Okay. I try and get that to other people. Tiffany, I'm going to pop you in here. You can hop in if you need to and talk. Um, if there's, I let other people do that. And the reason is it takes the time element of setting all these people up and paying all these invoices and doing all these things shifts that to somebody else. It's kind of, think about having as, an, as a, uh, a secretary or an, an operations manager. They do all that. All I do is find the deal, fund the deal, and move on to the next deal. You're swinging hammers. You're buying, you're paying all those guys to do all they got to do. I got one bill. I pay my contractor done. That's the investing side of it. So think of your business as that, because now, well, Jennifer, you're out there hiring the plumber and hiring this guy, hiring that guy. I'm looking at the next deal. And now I've got the money to do the next deal because I borrowed 90% from my hard money lender. And I funded the rehab with my private capital that I found somewhere else because how easy is it to find $300,000 to, to buy a house? How many people do you know right now that'll give you $300,000 to buy a house? Probably not many, 
but we probably all have at least two or three friends that would let us borrow 30 to 40 to flip one, right? It's easier to find. So let the Lachlan Capitals and the, the Caves and the lending homes fund the large acquisition and then let me go find the money to rehab the house. Hey, I need, hey buddy, I need 40 grand. Oh, here you go. I can do that. And I'll give you a 10% return on your money. And now I can be doing four and five flips at a time. Why? Because my contractor can manage it. That's what he does. He's got crews. They do that. I don't want to do that. I want to invest money. So you have to think that way. Okay. I use the analogy and I've said this a thousand times if you've been on this program. If you've got money in the stock market, let's say you have a 401k or you own Apple or whatever, you got some mutual funds. It's in the stock market, right? I say this because I know it's a ridiculous question and it's obvious what the answer is. So on Friday last week, when you guys were in New York on the New York Stock Exchange floor and you were trading your stocks within your IRA and in your portfolio, why did you buy that fund or this fund or that stock as opposed to these over here? Well, the obvious question is, well, Carson, I wasn't in New York. Well, why weren't you? Well, I was investing and I had a broker do that. They did all that. I said, oh, so you're paying someone to invest your money. Yeah, well, that's what investing is. So why are you swinging hammers? Why are you arranging for plumbers? Why are you doing all this? That's not investing. That's creating a job. Be an investor. Being an investor means making money from other people's money. And I said this previously, and I'll say it again for those that joined us here. You'll be successful if you responsibly use leveraged capital. I have no problem being in debt. Why? Because the person that I'm paying 4% to for 50 years on a three quarter million dollar loan is allowing me to make 18% on my rental properties. So I net out 14. How much did that cost me? They're happy. They're making their 4%, 5%, whatever it is we agreed on. We're buying mobile home parks right now. We're buying them at one and $2 million at a pop. Okay. And we're making a lot of money and I'm not putting a penny of my dollars into it. I'm using other people's money and we're making money hand over fist. Now you could say, oh, the whole world could collapse. Yeah, it could, but it's a good deal right now. People are making money. We've got the cash flow coming in. They're solid properties. Think like an investor, be an investor. Don't create a job for yourself. You'll get inundated with invoices and 1099s and all this other stuff. I have an accountant. She's good at that. I pay her. I've got an attorney. I pay her. I've got a general contractor. I pay her. These are people on my team. Do they work for me? No, they have their own businesses. They're competent in their own fields, but I'm good at what I do and they're good at what they do. Let them do it. Do you change your own oil? Tiffany, do you get down under the car and change your oil every week, every year? No. <laughs> no. Why not? I'm sure you're capable. <laughs> right. <laughs> But your time, but how many times do you do that? We don't. So the guy that does it for you does it in 10 minutes. Why? Because they do it in their sleep. I can get in there and do it. It's going to take me two hours. I don't have the time to do that. My time is more valuable to me than that. So I let other people do that because not because it's beneath me and, oh, I'm not changing my oil. Or I'm not cleaning my house. I don't have time to do it. And they can do it more efficiently because that's what they do. Think like that and you'll be successful. Get stuff off of your desk that you don't need by allowing other people to do it and pay them to do it. Whoa, 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 Carson, I don't have the money to pay them to do that. I'm not making the kind of money yet. That's true. So figure out what you can do, but streamline the process. You know, I don't pay my general contractor until the deal is done. I give them a little seed money to get started. And that comes from a loan I took, but I pay him at the beginning and I pay him at the end. It's typically how he works because we do so many deals. And it just, it works. So we're in and out in three, four months. So try and find those deals. I am adverse, totally adverse in the rehab world to getting into permits. People do them all the time. Nothing wrong with them. You got to get a permit. If you're dealing with a permit, you're dealing with what entity? The government. Is the government efficient at anything? No. And when they're not efficient, it costs you what? Time. And how much you're paying in interest each day? Time is money. I don't deal with them. Yeah, but Carson, you can make $200,000. You know, yeah, it's going to take me a year to finish that project. The bigger the project, the more zeros on the end of it. 
and the more zeros you potentially can lose. Would you do this? I've got an opportunity to take one deal this year. You'll make $200,000 on it if you do this deal, okay? To take a year to finish it. Everything you're gonna be doing is me in this deal. Or I'm gonna give you four deals that you can make $50,000 on. Which one do you want? Four deals. Why? Because I'm, I don't have to spend a whole year dealing with the government. There's a lot of unknowns with the permitting process and all that. All your eggs are in one basket, right? Right. Okay. If I make 10% more on each one of those deals, I can make an extra 20 grand. But am I going to make 20% more on, on that other deal to make the same amount of money? Probably not. Because it's going to be a, a different animal. And any mistake I make is going to be magnified. Get in, get out. Get in, get out. Get in, get out. Plus the money you're borrowing, people are going to see that you're turning it over quickly. They're not going to be forgetting about them for a year and then giving them money. And people love that. Because now I can give you the $100,000 and I can turn my $100,000 over four times and get paid each time. So now my amortized capital becomes even bigger. I'm getting 8%. But I'm getting 8% four times. So that translates into a different number in terms of ROI. My return on investment, $8,000 times four is $32,000 I made instead of eight. And the risk is a lot lower. So I take those deals all day long. So think in those terms, find private capital, but leverage yourself properly. I love hard money. If you got a good rate, eight and a half percent strong rate on hard money, that's good. You're not going to really beat that much anywhere unless you put more down. The less money out of my pocket, the better. Okay. I don't use any of my own money. Now I do have a, a, a HELOC. I got a line of credit and I do that. I got it at five, five percent and I'll use that for my flips, but it's not my money. I'm still borrowing. It's just cheap and I've got access to it. But when I need more, I go to other people. I pay them eight. 10% on the flip money. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Do you Ideally, have any tips on if, so right now we're doing like hiring out subs, which like you said, is another job. And I have a, like a regular job too, a W2 job. Um, what are some tips for when you're first starting out with a general contractor, like how to protect yourself so to protect yourself, you have to have a contract, okay? And in my contracts, I have performance benchmarks. So what I do is I walk a property, say, with another investor, just to make sure I've got my numbers. If you're getting started, I'm saying, I don't do that now. But just getting started, you want to make sure, hey, my rehab is $50,000. What does that look like? You got to have a number in your head, right? Because now you know if it's a good deal or not. Because if it's $100,000, it's not a good deal. So $50,000 on this rehab makes sense. We can sell this property and make a profit. Ballpark number, right? So now we get under contract, we dial down, and now we know where all that $50,000 is going. We got $5,000 for the roof. We got $4,000 for this. We got $6,000 in painting. We break it all down. So now I know what I need to look for. I'll go get a contractor. I'll say, hey, Mr. Contractor or Mrs. Contractor, come on in here. Give me a bid, get two or three of them. Now I get my bids back. I know in my head the ballpark where I want to be. And I look to see who's coming in on that ballpark. I don't know any of them from anybody. They're just all new people. One could be worse than the other, but they all came recommended, I'm assuming to me from somebody. So they have some degree of credibility. I look at them, I interview them a little bit. I get a feel for who they are. Look at the trucks, I'm looking at their crews. I'm doing this, I want to see some work that you've done. Okay, let's go forward. All right. Now I've picked Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, give me your scope of work, break it down. And then Mr. Smith, I want you to tell me how long you think this entire rehab is gonna take. You dictate to me that number. Because in my mind, I've got a number. It's gonna take me eight weeks. I wanna see what he has to say. Okay, it's gonna take me eight weeks. Okay, that's in line. Or six weeks, that's better. Or 10 weeks, that's worse. Well, let's see what we can tweak that. But I put performance issues in there. Now, Mr. Smith, you told me it was going to be eight weeks. 
I know things go wrong. I know people get COVID. I know it rains when we need to pillar the foundation. I know things happen. If we made this 10 weeks, you think you can get this done? Oh yeah, no problem. Okay, now right, let's do that. Well, it's a cosmetic deal. We're not worried about the weather too much. Everything's under roof. Let's roll. All right, 10 weeks. So now I have a performance clause in my contract that says, if you're not done by the 10 weeks, which you just told me you could do, then you're going to lose $100 a day. Okay. The other thing you got to be careful with is in your contract, you want to give them a little bit of money up front and then the balance at the end. You want a big nut at the end. You don't want to give them 5% or 10% at the end. And here's why. As they get eight, 10 weeks into this thing and it gets to the end and they know they got one more payment from you for 5% or 10%, it's a small number. And this big job comes down where they're going to get another 40% influx of cash. They're going to focus over there. And your little 5% is going to kind of sit there and sit there and sit there and not get done. So you got to create a big enough carrot at the end that they're not going to want to walk away and go take on another project. So what I do with my investors or my, my general contractors, if it's a three month gig, I give them 30% on the front end and I give them 70% on the back end. And the reason I did under three months is because they usually have a 90 day rolling invoice schedule. Okay. And they can pay all their people and fund all their stuff within 90 days. If they're good, they can manage all that. Now, if it goes longer than three months, then you need to give them another hit in the middle. So if it goes five, I'll do like 30, 30 and um, 40. Okay. So that keeps them incentivized. It keeps them liquid. Okay. So you have to have a contract with performance agreements, what the scope of work is. I attach their bid with it and tie it all in and make sure it's all done. I've got those contracts. If you need those contracts, you can let me know. I'll be more than happy to send those to you. Give me some time because I'm pretty wrapped up this week. I got a lot going on, but if you get it to me, I'll get it back to you within a reasonable amount of time. So hopefully that answers your question regarding your general contractors. Do it under yeah. contract, everything under contract, everything under contract. What did I say? Everything under contract. <laughs> if you <laughs> shake their hand, it's your best friend's dad, get them under contract. Does their bid include materials? It should, yes. Okay. Unless you decide you want to do that, which we just talked about. Why do you want to be going out and buying materials? Oh, I want to pick out the tile. I want to pick out the flooring. I want to do home HGTV. Great. Have fun with that. But tell them, I picked out the tile. It's at um, Floor and Decor. Go pay for it. Don't buy it and then try and back end all that stuff. Secure it under their name. Let them go and pay for it and pick it up. Because that is kind of fun. Right? <laughs> what are the questions we got? Odelia, you've been pretty quiet. You got any questions, Odelia? No, I'm completely new to this. I'm just listening and enjoying it a lot. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Um, real quick before you pop off, what are your biggest fears in investing since you're just getting started? Because I'll tell you, I was terrified getting into this when I first started. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any contacts. I was like, how do I do this? What are your biggest fears and concerns? Well, actually, I'm smiling because you kind of um, dealt with some of them. I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really want, I want to be an investor. I don't want to create a real big job. So, so I was thinking I'm going to hammer things and I don't know anything about anything. And now I'm happy that I don't have to do that. You don't. Um, <laughs> Um, so now I guess my next thing is really finding the deals. That's it. Yep. That is always the singular hardest thing to do. And, that, and, and I don't care if you're seasoned like I am or you're brand new. Finding a good deal is always going to be a struggle because you've got to find the financial um, means to make the deal work. Like I said before, just because a house has a bunch of tall grass and they haven't picked up the mail does not mean that that's a good deal just means it's a potential opportunity. The numbers have to work. And I went through those numbers before we, we wrapped up the last session. And those are critical. I follow those for every deal I do. If it does not meet that metric, 
you have to have the discipline to walk away. This is not an emotional equation. This isn't your boyfriend and your girlfriend or your personal home. This is a financial equation. If the numbers right. don't work, the numbers tell you to walk. So basically the numbers even dictate over market or you pick the market first? I don't pick the market. I pick the deal because the deal. It, it, it deal is a deal no matter where you are. So what does a deal really look like? We talked about the numbers a little while ago, but there's some other factors. Okay. Is everyone here in the Atlanta metro area? I'm assuming. I'm not actually, but I liked your previous lesson. So I'm listening. Where, where are you? Um, where are you? In, in, well, in the... I'm, I'm actually, I just moved back to the States from Europe and okay. I am in New York, but okay. I lo I'm looking to probably invest in Florida or Tennessee or something like that. Why is, why those states? They're red. <laughs> so I think it's a, a better legal position. And from what I've been researching, I already have a short-term rental in um, South Florida. Okay. I think the market is a little bit too expensive for me to go in now and just start a flip. I don't know, maybe not, I don't know. But um, I'm thinking maybe Tampa or Jacksonville, which have also increased a lot in value in the last yes. few years, but it looks like they still have some runway. I've also been looking at Nashville and Knoxville. I don't no. know. Nashville, no, definitely not Nashville. No. Do not go into Nashville. Okay. Um, I'm not going to get into the, I'm not going to dial down into that on this, this meeting here, but Tampa and Jacksonville, I think are great areas, uh, especially Tampa. Tampa's very young. Tampa, St. Pete, I think there's a lot of upside. There's a lot of older homes there. I know Tampa very well. I got family down there. I'm looking to invest there myself. I'm very high on Tampa. Let's I'm invest West. together. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you need to do, Adelia. So um, your fear, your concern was how do I get into this? Well, without getting into all the specifics, I'm going to do right. that in just a second. Nashville is overinflated. Nashville is going to crash. Okay. Okay. Tennessee is good. Nashville's not. The Southeast okay. in general is great. Georgia is yeah. probably the best of all of them. Georgia is set up. We're growing like mad. It's crazy down here. Uh, not just Atlanta, but all over. So part of the demographic you need to look at, and this goes for anybody, is in some of the Jennifer and Tiffany, you're probably more familiar with these towns, but um, you think about Atlanta and there's, there's a certain metro Atlanta that we consider being part of Atlanta, right? Whether you're in Conyers or whether you're in Alpharetta or whether you're in Gwinnett, it's still Atlanta. But once you start getting out into Clayton and getting out into social circle, you're getting a little bit further out from the commute. So that becomes a little more rural, a little bit less desirable. The population density isn't as strong. So the overbidding doesn't really happen out there. So even with the overbidding that you're getting, you can't take that into consideration because it could go away tomorrow. You have to look at the historical concept of what that area is and the demographics of who's buying it, as well as the population density and the reasons that people are going there. Okay, I focus on homes that meet the middle income. I'm trying not to get into the million dollar homes because why? At the top of the pyramid, there's only two buyers. Down here at the bottom of the pyramid is where most people are buying. I've got more of an opportunity to market. I've got more buyers. I've got more opportunity, more houses, and those kinds of things. I can turn and burn, turn and burn, turn and burn. So I look for that sweet spot. That sweet spot shifted a little bit, which there's a lot of factors going into play right now. COVID has hurt a lot of people's jobs to where the homes they were in, they can't afford. They're pulling out of them. They're moving into the rental market, creating opportunity to buy these homes. But when you buy these homes now, there's not enough people to buy them because they don't have a good job either, or they kind of stay where they're at. So we're kind of shifting from the, in this area, Odelia, $250,000 home is a pretty big, good size home for most people. We're shifting into the 350,000. What that looks like, where are you in New York? Sorry, I'm in the city actually. Okay, right so in the city, all right, yeah. in the city is crazy. I got family up in Jersey. They're out west of uh, Newark and I had my, my cousin bought a $750,000 house and it needed $150,000 worth of work. And Jennifer and Tiffany, I saw pictures of that house and that was a 145,000 split level home built in 1985 in Stone Mountain. Yep. That's what that house was in, in, in Madison, New Jersey. 
And I'm looking at that going, my cousin's Ashley. And I said, Ashley, here's what you get in Alpharetta for $750,000. And I sent her a brand new construction, 5,000 square foot home on a basement with coffered ceilings and six bedrooms and five and a half bathrooms and a three car garage on almost an acre of land. And she about fell out. And consequently, that's why we're seeing a lot of people from New York moving down. Um, so the value position is good, but don't get wrapped up in, hey, I'm, the house is going to sell for 300, but we're going to get bids at 350. Well, what if you don't? That, that's eventually going to stop. We're going to have a little bit of a correction here in the Southeast. Okay. We're not going to have a bubble. We're not going to have a crash. We're going to have a slight correction. That means the $300,000 house that was 300,000 18 months ago, and it's now 350 because everyone's going double-eyed gonzo is going to be 300 again, or maybe 310, but it's not going to have 350 all over it. Okay. Now yeah. Nashville, Nashville is going to have a serious correction. Nashville is going to drop probably about 18%. And it's because yeah. they're overinflated. If you wait another two years and then you get into Nashville, don't do that now. You'll get upside down quick. Okay. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. Tampa is oh, a very good market. So one of the ways to get off the bench, Odelia, is to partner with other investors. So one of the things I learned a long time ago, and I, this has stuck with me, and it was a kind of a corny little routine this guy did. He is a white guy and he had an Asian woman with him and he was presenting, he was speaking at a uh, real estate investment association. And before he got started, he said, hey, make sure you got a pen and paper because at the end of my presentation, I'm going to tell you, or my colleague, my Asian colleague is going to tell you how to make a million dollars in real estate, bar none. So he got into what he was selling and talking about. And about every 15 minutes, he'd bait the carrot. And he'd go, by the way, don't forget to have a pen and paper, because at the end, my colleague is going to tell you how to make a million dollars in real estate. So we're all like, waiting, and waiting, and waiting. We get through this process. We're all engaged in the thing. At the end, he goes, okay, got your pen and paper. Here's my colleague. She's going to tell you how to make a million dollars in real estate. And she starts speaking in Mandarin Chinese a mile a minute. <laughs> and we're all like, what's going on? We don't understand. Well, 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 wait, wait, we don't understand Chinese. And she didn't stop. She just kept going for like two minutes. And then she got all done. And he goes, there, that's how you make a million dollars in real estate. Obviously, this was a gotcha. I got you, right? So yeah. like, okay, so what's the catch? The catch is, if you want to learn Mandarin Chinese, move to China immerse yourself in the language because you're going to learn really quickly how to find a bathroom and you're going to find out really quickly how to say, how do I eat? What is this? Where do I go? You're going to navigate well and you're going to pick up on the language of Mandarin Chinese. So if you want to learn real estate, surround yourself with people that speak real estate. You're going to pick on terminology. You're going to pick up on uh, applications and processes and how to find money and all kinds of things associated with real estate because you're going to hear terms and you're going to hear processes that are going to make you think in different directions and you just surround yourself and you ask the question ask the question how much is two plus two how much is four plus four why is it four why is it this and it's the stupid question that you think but the more you ask questions and the more you engage and that's why i singled you out Odile, because you were quiet i wanted to have you come out and talk because <laughs> i had a feeling you were new and I want you to get off the bench and I want you to engage other people and ask them questions and be the person that's, hey, I'm not just going to be a fly on the wall. I'm going to get engaged. I want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I want to learn from you. I got two ears and I got one mouth. I need help. What can you do to help me? And that's Thank how it you. works. And yep. if, you, if you do that, you will learn continually how to grow your business. I think I thought I had it figured out for a while. Hey, someone told me that two plus two is four and I can flip a house if I follow this model. Boom, I'm docking it out. I'm an investor. I'm doing it. Two plus two is four. Here's another one. Two plus two is four. Here's another one. Two plus, it's working. This math works. This math works. I met another guy and he goes, hey, man, do you know three plus one equals four? I was like, whoa, you're right. Oh, I can buy this one two plus two. And I can do this one three plus one and get to the same equation, but I can approach it differently. Yes, you can. I didn't even think about that. It was right there in front of me. It's a, it, that's what I've always done. I've never used two plus two because I like this process better. And you're like, I get it because there's more than one way to do real estate. 
Okay, there's all kinds of creative acquisition strategies. There's all kinds of stuff to do. So be the person at these meetings, asking questions, engaging and saying, I know this is a stupid question, but people will answer your questions because why? We were all sitting exactly where you are right now. Never doing a deal, never doing a deal, looking for our first opportunity, not knowing where we're going to find the money, not knowing if we're going to fall on our face, not knowing how we're going to do it and saying, I don't know what I'm doing. But if you find the deal, people will come and help you and you will pay them out of the profit of the deal. I'm never going to come to you, Adelia or Tiffany and say, hey, if you give me $15,000, I'll be your mentor. Why? Why don't I do that? Because your expectation and what I'm going to give you are never going to line up. $15,000 might be your entire life savings and you're focusing everything into this and you expect in two weeks, you're going to flip a house and it's not like that. And so now your expectation level and all your savings are with me and I'm not performing. So the, what I do is I recognize that and I go to people like you guys and said, Hey, you need help. We can help you get off center. We can help you find a deal. And when you do the work and you find the deal, you bring the deal to me, I'll help you structure it. I'll help you flip it. I'll help you do everything. All I want is some of the profits, maybe most of the profits of that deal since I'm doing all the work, but you're going to learn how to do this. And in two or three or however fast you learn, four or five, six deals, whatever it is, you're not going to need me anymore because now you're going to know. And how much did it cost you? It cost you nothing because the deal paid for it. But there's so many people go, man, this is their mentality. They're like this. I'm not going to share this because I want to make $50,000 on this deal. And if I bring Carson or some other guy into this, he's going to take 35,000 of this and I'm not going to make much money. So I'm not going to do, I'm going to do this on my own and you're going to fail. And when you fail, you're going to end up losing $20,000 and you'll be like, man, I should have done this. But if you did it right and you allowed other people to help you and allow everybody in the process to make money, even you, you're also going to get a free education out of it. And that's what I did. I didn't go buy a ballroom class, you know, they do in the hotels. I didn't, you know, get something from Carlton Sheets off the TV. I didn't do anything like that. Why? Well, one, I don't learn that way. I learn by doing. I go out and I do things. Okay, I get up, I go do things. And if I'm not doing it, I don't get it. I don't like to read. I'm not a voracious reader, so I don't read books. I just do it and I get it. And the, the, the concepts, they resonate with me. And I replicate them. And the light bulb goes, I got this. I can do this. I do that and I do that and do that. So, okay, what else can I do? And I learned from this guy, three plus one is four. So I surround myself with people that are smarter than me. Okay. So do you guys go to uh, real estate investment associations in your area? I haven't done anything yet. Okay. Tiffany, do you? No, I mean, I joined REI right when the pandemic happened. So sure. I think a lot of places shut down, but okay. I would like to do stuff in person. Definitely. Yeah. So there's I joined a lot of, two days ago. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of what they call RIAs. Odelia, if you've never heard that term, Real Estate Investment Association, RIAs. And they meet all over the country. And yeah, some of them were shut down due to COVID. I actually run one here in uh, the Atlanta area in Norcross, Tiffany. It's called uh, North Point RIA. You can look us up, North Point RIA on Facebook. And we meet the last Wednesday of every month. But there's probably 50 of them in Atlanta. You're over in Decatur, I think you said? Yep, downtown. Yeah, so there's stuff on the east side. There's stuff on the south side. There's stuff everywhere. There is a platform which you can use anywhere, Odelia. It's called Meetup. You ever heard of Meetup? Yep. Okay. Go into Meetup and create a platform or an a, a account. It's free. And put in all of the interests you have associated with real estate. Buzzwords, networking, real estate, investment, um, social networking, anything and everything tied to real estate. Yep. Buy and hold, fix and flip, whatever you want to call it. Put all that stuff in there. And then what's going to come back to you is all of these meetings that meet in your area that you've defined on your platform that meet and you just go. Most of them are free. Hey, we're meeting at the bar and we're going to sit in the back room and we're talking about real estate. You may like it, you may hate it, but it's free. Surround yourself and then you go to another one the next night and another one the next night or you go to one a month or whatever, but get out and go. 
Okay, a lot of people are adverse to getting out with COVID and different states have different laws right now. But this that's why this platform is so great. We can do that. And there's a ton of people on this platform. If you're at home and you're looking to do stuff, I'm one of 20 something investors, mentors, coaches on this site. And I'm focusing in this group on the Georgia, the, the Georgia super group, which ideally that's fine. You're in there. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, but there's there might be one for New York. I don't know if we're that big yet, but you're welcome to come back here again. You, I have another one that I do at nine o'clock, which is called Walk the Flip. And it's everything about walking through flipping a home and what it takes, walking through cost analysis and everything. And then we go and take that into the field here locally and we meet on a property and do the same thing. It's all free. So there's opportunities to go out in your respective areas in your geographies, in your hometown and meet people operating in your area. And you just start expanding your network and your circle. Okay. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Get on Facebook. If you're not on Facebook or Instagram or whatever social media platform you are and find other networking groups within there. So for instance, I've got my Facebook page and I'm a member of 54 real estate groups across the country from multifamily investing to, you know, flipping to buy and hold investors to wholesalers. I'm in all of them and just start doing searches, wholesaling, New York, wholesaling, Tampa, there's a ton of them and you just join the group and read the posts, interact with them. The more you interact, the more feedback you're going to get. And you start building your network and people. I'm, I'm buying a $1.5 million trailer park in South Carolina because a wholesaler in Florida saw me on Facebook and I looked credible. Because that's really what Facebook is anyway, right? Just a big fancy look at me show, right? So she reached out to me and the power of what that is got me the deal. I mean, he just put it in front of me. And I could say yes or no. And we decided to go with yes. I would never have seen that. Never have seen it had it been not for social networking. Okay. So you can grow your business. You can grow your network. You can do all of these things from these types of platforms in REI USA, going to uh, meetups that meet around the area and where you live. Highly encourage you to do that. Surround yourself with people that know more than you. So now that I know a lot, I by far don't know everything. And I'm always learning. Have that mentality. Always be learning. I go to these meetings and I get to know a lot of people and I see a lot of the same faces, but I get out of my comfort zone and I go and talk to new people all the time because I'm constantly, I'm, that's time away from my family at night. I need to make that time count to grow my business, to help my family. So I'm not just going to have social time with a couple of people that I know that I see every other month. I'm going to go meet people I hadn't met before. And I'm going to learn who they are. I'm going to see how I can grow my business with these people. Okay. That's how you grow. Okay. Do those things. So I have a rule. Any one of these meetings I go to, if I find out I'm the smartest guy in the room, I leave because it's not worth my time. Do you know how many meetings I've left in five years? None. Zero. You're right. Because there's always somebody there that's smarter than me. There's always somebody there I can learn from. There's always somebody that's done something that I haven't done. Because I'm not the best in the world. I'll never be the best in the world. But I'm going to be better tomorrow than I was today. Right. Because I'm not competing with you, Adelia. I'm not competing with you, Tiffany. You guys are not my competition. Not because you haven't started because I'm competing against myself. Don't worry what the rest of the world is telling you. Oh, look at Grant Cardone. Oh, look at Tony Robb. That's a bunch of malarkey. They did what they did and I'm happy for them. Focus on you. How can you be better tomorrow than you are today? By learning and growing, because that's your benchmark. Michael Jordan didn't make his high school football basketball team his sophomore year. He was cut. The next year he made it because he said, I got to do better than last year for myself. I don't need to beat out Johnny Smith. Johnny Smith plays a different position. Than me. I need to do better than what I did last month and better the next month and better the next month. And he went on to do it and he wasn't afraid to take the shot. Everyone talks about how great Michael Jordan was and he made I don't know, 650 game winning shots, but he missed 950 game winning shots because he wasn't afraid to take them. Have that mentality and you will be successful. You will. It will take time. It will take work. 
you'll take initiative, you'll take perseverance, and you'll be up and down and up and down, but eventually those hills and valleys will kind of be a little bit more steady, okay, and I'll still keep going up into the right. I, I, I remember when I first started, I was like, yeah, I got a deal, I got a deal, I made $5,000 on a wholesale deal, I was killing it, I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm running around my house, woohoo, it's great, I was excited, and that was done, I'm like, now what, I gotta get another deal, all right, move on, got another one, one month, I made $20,000 wholesale and property. So I was really excited. The next month, I was like, I got to close something or I'm not going to eat. <laughs> it was like that. How do you go from that high to that low in one month? Well, that was what this business was. So it, I, I was taught by my successes and my failures to have multiple streams of income and to not be a one-trick pony. But that takes time. You can't chase 10 squirrels at once. Chase one squirrel do that well, get that knocked out, focus on the next one, build over time. So as Delia, Tiffany, find your first flip, find your first buy and hold, knock that down, get it right, do it right, consult with others, you'll be successful, then move on to the next one. Be conservative in your approach. If $5,000 is going to upset the apple cart, because if one little thing goes wrong, then that's not a good deal. There should be enough in that deal that if the whole thing goes sideways, Everybody still either breaks even or makes money. Should never be in a deal where you have any chance of losing money. I never do that. Now I'll pass on some other deals where people will take because they need the deal. I don't need that. I'm not willing to risk that. I'd rather not have the deal than lose money. Think about that. If you could break even on a deal or lose 20 grand, which would you rather do? I don't break even. Sometimes breaking even means not taking the deal because it's too risk adverse. So think about that when you get into it. That's why I use that mathematical formula. Were you both on my last call when I talked about that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. So that's critical. Okay. Make sure that you, you use that. And that goes whether it's a buy and hold. Okay. Here's, here's, here's another uh, piece of math that I use for buy and holds. A lot of people will say, hey, I've got $1,000 in rent and I'm making... $600 mortgage payment. So how much money are they making? 400. Okay. But are they really making 400? No, because they still have insurance and taxes and maintenance. No, I'm talking your, your total PITI payment. Insurance, taxes, principal interest, $600. Are they still making money? The answer is probably yes, but they're not making $400. Or the better, the better equation is, hey, I've got an $800 mortgage payment, PITI, all in, principal, interest, taxes, insurance, 800 bucks. I'm renting it for a thousand. I'm making 200 bucks a month. I turn to them and I say, you're actually losing money. And they're like, wait a minute, how am I losing money? Thousand minus 800 is 200. I'm making 200 bucks a month. I said, yes, technically you're making $200 a month, but your approach is wrong. You've got to manage that property. It takes your time. If you were to hire a management company, that's 10%. Well, I'm not hiring a management company. I know, but you're doing it. That's time. So you've got a job to manage this, but you're just not paying yourself. 10% of management. In four years, five years, six years, whatever, you're going to need a new heating and air conditioning system, a new roof. Plumbing's going to go out. Something's going to happen to that property and money's going to need to fix that. The $200 a month you see make at the end of the year is only $2,400. I got a plumbing issue at one of my properties it's going to be $3,000. Your profit's gone. So you have to put another 10% away for deferred maintenance. A renter moves out at the end of the year. You don't move a guy in like literally the next minute. You got to clean the place up. You got to repaint it, blah, blah, blah. You're looking at $2,500 to $3,000 just to do a normal house. Just if it's basic. How much money did you make in a year? 2,400, well, that's gone. So you have to allow for vacancy. So I put away 6% for vacancy. 6% is about two weeks to turn a property over. So I got 10% to management, 10% to um, deferred maintenance, and another 6% to um, vacancy rate. What is that? That's 26%. So now my $1,000 in rent is really 740. So now I've got a mortgage payment of 800, I'm losing 60 bucks a month. I'm not even making any money. 
right? You can follow me there? Yes, depreciation is the only yeah. thing that'll save. Yeah. Got Some people will invest that way. They say, you know what? I just want a house that when I buy it later and I sell it later, I'll make 50 grand on it. Well, yeah. you, didn't, you, know, you didn't really make 50 grand on it because you're losing $600 a year and fixing stuff up. Right. So it's not really that way. So why not buy the house where it still makes you money after the 26%? Well, I don't need to pay someone 10% to management. Well, is this the only house you're ever going to buy? Well, no, I'm going to buy more. Well, what happens when you got 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 of them? Don't you want that? Well, yeah. You're going to manage all those? Well, no, I'll hire a management company. Well, how is that going to be affordable? Well, I'll increase rent by that time. Really? Is it going to really raise rent that much money on all these deals, every one of them? Because I'll tell you, a year ago, I owned three, three properties. A year ago, at this time, I owned three doors. I now own 48. And by the end of March, April, I'm going to own 140. Mm. Okay. It's happening that fast. And had I not built in that equation of the 26%, because now we're going to have to hire somebody to manage these for us. We're fortunate enough that we'll be able to hire one person and she can manage all of our properties as opposing, as opposed to this management company for that property, this management company for that property, 10%, 10%, 10%. I can take it all together and have one person for probably 4% and do all of them. That's wow. just what we can do. So my point is eventually you're going to grow. If you're not, then you're, you're in the wrong business. You know, if you just want three properties to be done with it, fine, manage it yourself, but it's still going to be a headache at some point. I don't my want point to be is, a headache. What's that? I want to have rental income, but I don't want to be a landlord. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. So get to the point where you, you can afford to hire a management company. Right. Yeah. That's 10%. It's just part of doing business. Build yeah. that into the acquisition strategy. Don't take the deals that don't yield that. And then you'll be able to pay that without losing any sleep, without blinking an eye. It's just part of the gig. Mm. So you build that in by knowing what your rent is going to be and what your costs are going to be after that, right? Yes. Basically. So the, the basic math again is rent minus 26%. Right. That's my starting profit. So in this case, $1,000 minus 26 is 740. My profit is represented between that 740 and my PITI mortgage. Correct. Okay. So if it's $600, I'm truly making 140. Right. Okay, now the other money, the 26%, it's not going away. I'm putting it in a bank account. Mm -hmm. Hey, the right. roof went out. Oh, it's right there. I got three grand. Let's pay that off. Yep. Now, at some point, that profit builds to $15,000, $20,000 sitting in the bank. Do I need $400,000 sitting there to make sure that the air conditioner isn't going to go out? No. At some point, I'm going to say, okay, I got enough there. Now I'm going to take all that profit because I don't need to. Keep it going. Oh, I got five grand. I need to go out. Boom, five grand goes out. Build it back up. Take all the money in again. Right. But I'm still getting 140 every month. Yep. And that's how you do that. So I've got to that's cut good. off here. My time is up. Please join us again here on uh, the, the Georgia Supergroup. Um, tell your friends about it. Get your friends into REI USA. Um, we'd love to have you guys. I appreciate you joining us. Great questions. I want you guys to walk out of this thing stronger than when you came in. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. My name is Carson Olinger. I'm owner of Capital City Equity Group here in Atlanta. My email is Carson at CapCityEG.com. That's Carson at CapCityEG.com. My, my um, cell phone is 678-478-2230. Follow me on Facebook. Uh, my personal name, Carson Olinger. Follow me at Capital City Equity Group. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. We do a lot of stuff on there to show you how to flip homes and get into investing and all kinds of tips and tools. Follow us there or subscribe to the channel, I should say. Like us on Facebook. And if you're here locally, um, even if you're not local, um, reach out to us on our North Point RIA Facebook page and join that group as well. We meet the last Wednesday of every month in Norcross, Tiffany, if that's something you want to join us. Yeah, Appreciate how do I get the address, Carson? Um, go on. Yeah, I, I'll get you the, the address. Shoot me an email and I'll get that. Okay, okay, we'll do. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, guys. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. All right.